Hello. Yeah. What about now? Yeah, it's better. It's a little better, yeah. yeah. Where are you calling from? Yeah. Uh, I'm from India. I connected last week. Uh, this is my second time connecting. Oh, is it? Okay. Right. You're a Sanatani? Uh, yes. Um, I'm trying to learn Islam. You know, uh, I've, I've explained about myself last week during the, the Vinayaka Charity live session. Yeah. Uh, so okay, you got some more I'm questions for us? Yes, yes, yes. So right. today uh, I would like to have some clarification regarding um, uh, this is personally considered as a controversial topic within the non Muslim community uh, that is the marriage life of uh, Prophet Muhammad. May peace be upon him. Guy, so come on. I you, know, you know, we are done to that with that topic. Can you bring something new? Honestly. Bring something. No, I, no, this is personally, I would like to get some clarification because we got I enough videos on that. You can watch our past streams. Okay. Okay. You okay, believe sure, in God. No you believe in God, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually. Okay. Uh, what makes what makes more sense to you, polytheism or monotheism? No, no. I think I, we've already discussed this last week. I, I if, if you hope you remember uh, that I'm I'm actually uh, going through Islam on the basic thing. So that is why I want to clarify certain things. Which is considered controversial in non-Muslim non community. As a person who is pursuing Islam, I would like to know whether it's true or false. That's the reason I joined this session to clarify myself. Yeah, but but you're not a Muslim yet, am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I believe in monotheism. I, okay, so when you say monotheism, what do you understand by that term? There's only one God. And who is that one God? Um... Right now, uh, I am actually worshipping Lord Shiva, but again, um, I've been in doubt for a very long time. I, I uh, right what, now, I'm what makes you to... think Shiva is that only one God? What makes you convinced? Because, as far as I remember, Shiva has a wife, right? Parvati, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think we all do you expect, do you expect a God to have a wife. No, uh, do you expect no, God again, to have uh, children? He has children as well, right? No, Ganesh. and there's yeah. another one, I think. Yeah, I think I and he lusts and he lusts. Yeah, yeah, so I think how do you expect, how do you expect a monotheistic God to have a family? Mm -hmm. No, it is. Uh, personally, the reason why I chose is I, I, I am from a Vaishnavite background and... Uh, no, but Vaishnavites, uh, has... regardless of you being a Shivite or Vaishnavite, the question still mm -hmm. remains. If you believe mm -hmm. in a monotheistic God, he has no partners, mm -hmm. yeah? Whereas in this case, yeah. he actually has a wife who is his partner and actually a goddess who can create life like Ganesh from the dirt of her body, yeah? And from sandalwood and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you don't believe in monotheism if you believe in Shiva or even, even Vishnu. Same thing, Vishnu also has a wife. Mohini. Yeah, the thing is, yeah. The no, thing not is, Mohini. Uh, Lakshmi, yeah. Lakshmi, sorry, sorry. Yeah, the, th the thing is, um, I, I, you know, I'm from Tamil Nadu, so we have a concept called Tamil type of philosophy. Yeah, you believe in Murugan, isn't they... it? You believe in Murugan as a Tamil. Murugan is actually a completely different uh, worshipping group of people. You know, it got merged with the Shaivism, but, yeah, but uh, most most Tamils Murugan... I know they worship Murugan if they're Hindu. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which, exactly. which I think Murugan is also the son of Shiva, right? No, that is as per Purana, not as per uh, as per history. See, Purana, that's why it's right. the Tamil side of philosophy that reject uh, these Shiva Purana. Okay, no problem. But the problem still persists. Why would you believe a god yeah. who needs a wife and children? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is the same question I have, but what according to my understanding about I think you're asking the Shakti, which is normally considered as a wife of Shiva, but 
uh, under my understanding what uh, it is shakti is uh, considered as a strength in sanskrit yeah we so are not talking about the, we are talking about the aspect of the personification of shakti as the wife of shiva no that is uh, see uh, how do i say i think it is philosophical manner they have explained that as wife the actual understanding is in in tamil there is a word called uh, shivan illayan shakti illa shakti illayan shivan illa which means there is no shakti without shiva and there is no shiva without shakti so the exact meaning of this so is he is then he's he's contingent on shakti which means he is dependent on shakti no it is the the shakti meaning is strength so what the people are telling is we humans uh, we, we we remove shakti from our body we are dead body shakti is energy literally we we do walk we do sleep we do speak is everything because of shakti which is en- which is the energy if you want to go go to gym and work how out can, you need wait, shakti wait, how, can, how can the energy of shiva be separate from him uh it's like we are respecting the almighty god because almighty has shakti right that like doesn't answer my god question the question is how can how can the energy of your god be separate from him that's a question because you said without uh, without shakti shiva wouldn't exist am i right which means he's dependent huh, that's, uh, on this shakti which is separate from him which is a female personification in the form of parvati Mm-hmm. yeah so it is separate from him mm-hmm. and he's dependent on this entity which is called shakti in your language mm-hmm. so you see your god if he is monotheistic and he's dependent uh, implies that he is not almighty he's not all powerful he's not uh, someone who is uh, independent but what if we see shakti as an attribute of almighty god because the god yeah, will not we won't you, be fearing him if you consider it, shakti to be the attribute of god then why are you personifying mm-hmm. it as a separate will without without whom this god wouldn't exist it's still problematic when you personify it isn't it no the meaning is not actually the god wouldn't exist it's, i don't think so it's the right meaning it's like um how do i say so we fear the almighty god you know if as for islam uh, the muslim fear allah because the muslim thing allah is almighty all powerful so if you remove those attributes whatever the greatest attributes you have with almighty god if you remove those attributes yeah but we don't muslim say we don't say the attributes of allah has a separate will mm-hmm. like the way parvati does so it's not the, you can't compare apples and oranges here it is like that christian guy who came earlier he was trying to personify the attribute of allah yes and then trying to compare it with mm-hmm. jesus it doesn't work like that we don't give attributes to the att- uh, sorry we don't give will to the attributes of allah subhanahu wa taala that's the reason mm-hmm. he's independent of anyone and anything because his will is the one which prevails over everything else but your in your case parvati has her own will shiva has his own will and they both need each other am i right yeah yeah there you go. So it's not an independent uh, god it's dependent just like you know in 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 the trinity of the christians they are codependent on each other the father son and holy spirit mm-hmm. similarly in the case of yourself where you believe only in shiva and not the other gods and goddesses maybe except for parvati again there is an interdependency between parvati and shiva they depend on each other so you see my friend you don't believe in monotheism you are a polytheist doesn't matter how you frame it you're still a polytheist mm-hmm. okay? okay so tell me why why do you consider shiva to be god what is it that makes him god and and no, did she actually I, i don't know do you believe in some sort of a a scripture or do you just feel that yes he might be god because your family your community they believe and worship shiva is there any no, scripture uh, you this, believe in no for this particular question i think last week i have already explained this 
in the same panel uh, very clearly uh, that I was born Vaishnavite uh, who was not interested in Vaishnavism because Vaishnavism has uh, one God, Vishnu, Avatars, multiple gods. I believe Vaishnavism leads to polytheism. And I also believed in monotheism that there is only one God. So whom do I choose among all the so-called all the so-called gods or Hindus? Okay, so let me at least take uh, Shiva because Shiva is considered as a My friend. Central which scripture? I asked you about the scripture. In... You're giving me some other, um, I don't know, lecture. <laughs> Just no, tell me, do you believe in a scripture don't... or not? Uh, I would like to study some scripture related to Tamil Shaivism, but unfortunately, I couldn't. No, I'm asking it. you because you already believe Shiva to be God. Is that belief mm -hmm. based on certain scripture, or is it just because no. you you follow your forefathers I, and you, and your family and your community? No, I just want to follow what my mind says. That's the reason I chose it. I, there is no proper scripture related to Tamil Shaiva philosophy. Yeah. So you believe That's in no Shiv Puran? You know? Do you believe in Shiv Puran? No. You don't believe in Shiv Puran. Is there any scriptures no. you have read that you you think that is from God? No, nothing like that. Okay, so where is your knowledge about Shiva coming from then? Um, I saw some. Uh, Tamil Shaiva uh, people, they are speaking about the concept of Tamil Shaiva Siddhantam. So I thought maybe this sounds a little logic. You know, they don't believe in Shiva Puranam. They don't. They they reject uh, that uh, Shiva has form. That they, according to their belief, uh, Shiva is formless and he doesn't have wife and everything. And also this Puranic thing, I strongly believe that these are written by man. This is not at all. Okay, but the question, like, look, even if you heard from certain Shivites who don't believe Shiva is a form, whatever it is, have uh -huh. you never questioned where did they get the information from? No, that is, I try to get that particular answer. I try to get some books related to Tamil Shivites, but unfortunately, I couldn't able to get it. No, no. Before I, you I believed it, did you, did you research it before you started to believe it? Or you just believed it because it sounded the reason, you know, the reason, the reason why I, I didn't I did believe on those people is these Purana basically especially any Purana uh, if you keenly observe uh, you know Lord Shiva has been portrayed as a villainic character for example I think in the Purana where he he beheads uh, Parvati's son and then he the orders to behead any yeah, the Ganesh story. If, for example, if I want to praise my God and I'm writing some Purana, would I be writing in, in, in a negative way or in a positive way? As a devotee, I want I to know, praise depends. in a positive way. You know, so you'll be surprised how many Hindus actually believe that to be the truth. Whether it's positive or negative, regardless of that, you know, people will believe anything. Like the guy who just came earlier, he'll believe in aliens even though there's no evidence for it. And he says he's scientific in his approach. So people, you know, no, they will that's... believe anything. It doesn't mean that it might sound negative to you, but for those people, mm -hmm. it is literally their dharma. It is literally their religion. That's the reason you have no, this I... Ganesh Chaturthi every year, you know, where you get millions mm -hmm. of Hindus, they make this huge statues of Ganesh and they take it all around for 10 days and then they throw it in the river. Yeah. So if you think they didn't believe it, why do you think they celebrate this festival every year? I don't, I don't believe in the festival. Exactly, so they do believe it. it. Don't say no, they don't. So, you know, no, the, question I don't, you I don't ask, the question you need to ask is, is these, these uh, saints or rishis or whatever uh, people that you heard and listened to, you should have asked them, where did you get this information from? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So let me ask you this. Is it possible for someone to just meditate and get to know about God? Uh, from my personal experience, meditation do uh, calms you down, calms you uh, physically. You know, during COVID time, I did try it. 
because it was very difficult time in our country. I was a little stressed out and uh, I tried meditation for the first time. I think you know about the OM, the sound OM. I put my headphone, I just put the OM sound in YouTube. It just simply say OM for 20 minutes. I just closed my eyes and didn't think about anything. And then after 20 minutes, I opened my eyes. It felt different. I felt calmness in my mind. Like the whole body was calm. The stress was reduced completely. So yeah. in that thing, the meditation portion, I do believe there is some scientific reason. That wasn't my question. <laughs> once I, again, no, I don't know whether it's a spiritual or not. You have gone off tangent once again. My question is, would you get to know anything about God just by meditation? Sorry, would you repeat the question? Would you get any information about God just by meditation? Uh, I don't think so. There you go. Because if you just want to remain calm, you know, there are many methods. Maybe listen to the Quran one day. It has more, more meaning than Maybe just calm, may... you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe so I don't the know. Quran with some meaning some and saints have down. done it. Say again. Maybe I don't know because some some people say they have you know read through yeah, God. Yeah, you should or try it one day. You know, God. download do, download a translation of the Quran in English or whatever language you prefer, and then listen mm -hmm. to the Quran, and it will give you not only information, but it will also calm you down. Yeah, I do listen to audio sometimes, you know, the Tamil yeah. uh, audio sometimes. Yeah, you can listen to the Tamil translation maybe, inshallah, yeah. So you see, my friend, look, yeah. God, if God exists, then God is able to communicate. And if he's going to communicate with us, it is going to be in a form we understand. Otherwise, you know, people will be just speculating like the way you're doing. You listen to someone mm -hmm. and it feels good to you, you say, yes, that must be true. Then you listen to somebody else and then you say, no, that sounds better actually. So I'm going to start believing that. But if you okay. are someone who knows God exists and you know that God is able to communicate to you, then would it not be better for you to read the revelation from God rather than shopping for God from different sources? Yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm. I think you're convinced that monotheistic God makes more sense than polytheistic. That's it. That is a huge step already. That's a that's progress to me. So maybe you know, read the Quran with translation, and you will not only gain knowledge, you will gain the understanding of Islam, and you'll understand your purpose in life, and you'll learn many things from the Quran. If I were to ask you right now, so, what is the purpose of your existence? What would you say? Um, I want to be useful to the society as much as possible to be good to the fellow human beings. Okay. Try to be good as much as possible and do good deeds. And to? And to go to heaven. Yeah, but how do you know you're being good to the community? Maybe you think it's good. Maybe it's not good for the mm -hmm. community. Yeah. Have you thought about mm -hmm. that? Uh, so, so give me something good that you can do for the community. Uh, charity, for example, I think you can do that, right? Yeah, charity. Yeah. yeah so charity, you see, charity is uh, one of the pillars of Islam. Mm -hmm. What else can you do good in, in the community that you think will benefit the community? Uh, maybe try to... Um, Stop the hatred between the two communities, one of the biggest problems in my country. Okay, and how would you achieve that? Maybe I'll try to learn about the, the religion, the, the Islamic religion and the history, and maybe I'll try to explain that to my Hindu friends, you know, if they have any misunderstanding. Yeah, that's brilliant. We'll bring you on our panel because that's exactly what we do. <laughs> What else can you do for the community? You know, everything good you'll do, it'll become, it'll be mm -hmm. part of Islam. Trust me, you can count the list which you consider good. And everything bad, which you will want to avoid, is something that Islam has made haram anyway. Yeah, take uh, mm -hmm. alcohol, gambling, fornication, adultery, murder, 
stealing, telling lies, you know, um, all of these things are prohibited in Islam. And you and I will agree that this is something we should all avoid. Yes, 100%. Yes. So you see, all of this information that you are now learning is actually come to us from God because without someone who gives you the basis of morality, which is objective, you know, which is not based on my whims and desire or yours or the communities, because he's created us so he knows what is best for us and what is not good for us. And that's the reason in the Quran you'll see the do's and the don'ts, the halal and the haram, clearly spelled out for you. And this is okay. what one would expect from the communication or the revelation that is received from Almighty God. Because you see all these problems that we see in our societies is because of people, they have abandoned the belief in God, the worship of God, who gives us the purpose of our existence. And he tells us exactly what is good for you as an individual, as a family unit, and even as a community as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So instead of you, yeah. you know, wasting your life, your time, your effort or money or whatever it is, read the Quran. Mm -hmm. And inshallah, you know, God willing, you will get the message and you will yeah. see the change in your life. See, yes, I'm currently, I'm actually reading it. You know, I'm, I'm listening to Tamil uh, audio Quran because I have English Quran, but I, I don't understand. I don't know. It's very complex for me. So right now I'm listening to the Tamil translation of the Quran in chapter 2. Uh, I think it's Al-Baqarah chapter. Uh, I've completed some 120 verses. So that's one of the reasons why I would like to... I, and the reason why I bring the topic of the, the controversial thing about the marriage of Prophet Muhammad is... That's the yeah. reason because I want to get clarification because in internet, there uh, are several controversial things about the Prophet Muhammad. You know, if I'm studying the Quran, I want clarification. No, but because the thing is, look, if you, most of the time you see these things being discussed on the internet, it's not for the clarification. It's mainly basically they want to somehow malign Islam and the Prophet, peace be upon him. Because trust me. No, no, no. That is not my back, intention. No, no, I'm not saying you. I'm saying generally on the internet. If you go back mm -hmm. only a few, I don't know, generations, you will know that your grandparents, mm -hmm. great, great grandparents probably married at a very young, young age. Yeah, which is not uncommon in India, to be honest. Even and until yeah. now, even until now in yeah, some child in marriage some was a big thing. But you see, Islam actually puts regulations in these things. It's not like you can go and marry at any age. It gives you two okay. critical, two main criteria. One is the physical fitness and the, the other is the mental maturity. If these are not found, even if the girl is 12 years old or 15 years old, then this is something that you cannot get married because these are conditions for a married life to be sustainable. No. Hashim, even if she's 30 and she's yeah. not, not 12 or 15, even if she's 30 years old and she's not physically able or mentally mature, you can't marry her. Yeah. And these definitions, for example, 18 year old or 21 years old, these are all man-made. Yes, and these have changed in history. If you look at history, this has changed. Some of the earliest kings in England, they married six years old. And at that time, it was perfectly normal. And there was no restrictions. There was no criteria like the way Islam had a criteria. If you look at the Prophet, peace be upon, me, upon him, his first wife was much older than him. Yes? Yeah. But many of these people, they say, no, he actually liked, liked children. It's, it's crazy. Look at most of his wives. They were either widows or they were uh, divorcees or they were much older than him. You know, if you look at the history and the biography of yeah. the Prophet, peace be upon him, then you'll understand his, his character and what kind of a person he was. In fact, the, the Quraysh of Makkah gave him not only the authority to rule over them, but they gave him like, you can have all the women you want. You can have all the wealth you want. You can have the rulership of this place. You know, he rejected all of that. So if he was indeed someone who was, you know, after material wealth and after pleasure and 
all these things, authority and rulership, he would have accepted it. But look at the response that he gave. The Prophet ﷺ said, even if you place the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, I will never stop saying La ilaha illallah. I will never stop submitting to the will of the Almighty God. Uh, Hashim, sorry. Prasad. Yes, uh, Prasad. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, what what's stopping yes, you? What 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 what's stopping you from from embracing Islam? Uh, I mean, I'll I'll ask you blankly. What's stopping you? Good question, Sheikh. Yeah, I was. Sorry, I sorry. I haven't. I haven't completely read it, so maybe I'm in baby steps. No, but but, but uh, how old, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm thirty-two. Thirty-two. Now look. Only Allah knows. Maybe you live another 32 or double that. Or maybe you'll die today. It's not. But you know you can spend a lifetime learning about Islam and it never finishes. You can spend a lifetime. We learn about, we are Muslims, but we're still learning about Islam daily. We're still going on about our daily life, learning things and still equipping ourselves with, with, with the lots of things that we didn't know. For example, tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is unbeknown to us, but we find that with the time. Now, now, uh, at the beginning of the conversation, you were saying that you are monotheistic, but then Brother Hashim, Ustad Hashim, Jazallah Khair, proved to you that you are polytheistic, not monotheistic. And and by Allah, what we want, not just for you, but for all, everyone to worship the one true God, Allah Jalla wa Ala, the God of of all the living, the God that created the, the universe and created everything that that the, the wind, the ants, every cosmological thing that you see, Allah is the, the is, is the creator of it, is the originator of it. So so if I might to ask you mm -hmm. Do you believe in this one God or are you still on your polytheistic after the explanation of Hashim? No, no, I, I do strongly believe in believe in one almighty, but I'm just it is in the verge of exploring the concept. Because as you, as I said, I was in I was worshipping Lord Shiva, and uh, you know there are a lot of Shaivets itself have contradictionary yeah. point in terms of explaining who is Shiva. Some say he's the Adi Yogi, like he was a man. Some say he was a man. Well, well you, see, you see a picture of a man. They, Shiv, they represent Shiva as a man with nice body and that. But his son, Ganesh, he's, he's got a, 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 a potted belly. He, he doesn't believe in that, Sheikh. He, he doesn't believe in that. No, no, but I'm just Ganesh, saying. No, I'm, I'm just saying in Ganesh, he had the potted belly. Uh, his mother, poverty, something else. You have got uh, the, the thing about it. There is nothing like a god that is n not liked into anything. Allah Jalla wa Ala in the Quran says, "Laisa kamiflihi shay." There is nothing likened unto him. He is sublime. He is he is the all powerful, the all, the originator. He is the merciful. He is the compassionate. He is the knowledgeable. He is all of these attributes, beautiful attributes, and what goes with them. So, so at the end of the day, you say, and you want to, you want to, to kind of like examine. You can become a Muslim and continue on your journey. And trust me, you will, you will continue on the journey, on that journey. And it's never enough. It doesn't matter if you were to live. 300 years, you will still be on the journey of knowing Allah, of knowing Islam, of knowing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that. You know, people has written books regarding Allah Jalla wa Ala, regarding the Prophet, which is hundreds and hundreds of pages. If you were to study it, it will take you a lifetime. Do you understand uh, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can understand. But uh, what I... Uh, thinking is, you know, I should at least uh, go through the entire Quran once just to understand each and every topic, just the basic thing. And well, can, you, can you guarantee your life? The clarification. Can you guarantee your life? Sorry, can you guarantee your life? I believe in God. 
So I believe. Yeah, but, but the, I. But the answer is if I you stand. Like, what, I don't which know guarantee, God, but yeah. The answer, the answer, Prasad, it's which God you believe in. Prasad, what we're trying to tell you is this. You can believe in God. Oh, everyone here believes in God, right? But which mm -hmm. concept of God? Well, uh, look, as far as knowledge, yeah, there's a wealth of knowledge, brother. The, the, the guy that's in the middle up top, the brother, the sheikh, right? Ask him right now. Are you a scholar? He's going to say what? No, I'm a student of knowledge, even though he's got years under his belt of studying, right? But he will still, out of humbleness, say, I'm a student of knowledge. We're all students of knowledge, right? So what we're trying to tell you is, listen, when it comes to God, there's a certain concept of God that you should be worshiping. We're just trying to get you to understand that concept of God, right? And if you agree with the concept of God, and then you can go and learn about Islamic history, you can go learn tradition uh, of the prophet. Exactly. You get into those things after, right? What you want to, what you want to do right now, the first thing you should be doing is trying to understand and, and learn about your creator who created you and worshiping that creator the way that he deserves to be worshiped. So can we come to a common understanding on who and what God is? Yes. Okay, when you think of God, what comes to mind? Three, two, one, go. He doesn't have any form. Like, he should not have any form. Thank it, you. Exactly. Thank you. That's what the chef was saying. You see, that's your natural inclination, bro. You can't, you, you got stuck. You're like, wait, what do I say? That, that's, that's your natural inclination. There's nothing like unto God. Whatever you think he is, he's not that, right? Would you say he's all powerful? Yes. Would you say he's all knowing? Yes, 100%. Okay. Would you say that this creator sent down individuals to guide humanity? Could be possible. If, if you okay. Want. Would you say could be okay. would you say that this creator created things? That that human beings cannot see, but they exist. Things like angels, things of that nature. Mm, yes, because scientists are discussing about the multiverse thing, another dimension thing. They could be another dimension beings, so it could be possible. Yes. Okay, and do you believe that this this creator is is one and indivisible? He he was never begotten. Nor will he be yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, my brother, you agree. There you go. You're Shef, half a Muslim you're there. Shabbat. You're you're half a Muslim there. Uh -huh. We just we just you understand all this that brother Central Dawa has explained to you and what with what uh, equipped with what uh, brother Hashim was telling you. It's is you have a sense of Islam in you, Prasad. You know, you have a sense of Islam in you. So so what is what is this islam that we speak about is to submit to this creator submit to him in worship in supplication in everything do not associate any partners with him so do you agree to that yeah 100% the, the reason okay. why i'm, I'm, I'm yeah. telling is because now, the, the, i'm studying the basics of islam is because it's tomorrow if i yeah. make any decision i be answerable yeah. to my parents. I should be able to everyone, and I should be answerable. No, 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 Prasad, Prasad, brother, brother, Prasad, you should be answerable to Allah. This is the first thing. Uh, the you're not answerable to anybody. The reason why I'm telling you this because on judgment day, no, your your parents are not gonna be there to help you. I'm not going to be there to help you. Your children, if you have any, they are not there going to help you. Society in general, it's not going to be there to help you. Everybody will be saying myself, 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 myself. So in this in this instant, you have to be selfish. You have just to, th to think about your salvation, not, not anyone else. Not anyone else, because... First of all, fix yourself, then think about 
what what's gonna come when you come to that bridge you'll cross it but before then think about your own salvation think about how do you kind of uh get something that will serve serve you in the hereafter and the only thing that will serve you in the hereafter is i believe there is no god worthy of worship except allah and that muhammad is his messenger this kalima this profession of this this is your salvation for the hereafter you know and, and, and the law says in the quran in, ch in chapter two mm -hmm. just to touch on what the sheikh said he says when it is said to them follow what allah has revealed they respond no we only follow what our what forefathers we found our forefathers practicing but then yeah. allah poses a, a question he says would they still do so even if their forefathers had absolutely no understanding or guidance no. right no they wouldn't they wouldn't so what they we're wouldn't. trying to say to you uh, prasad brother is look Maybe your family members prior to you were misguided, but you now have come to the understanding that, yeah, look, maybe they were on the wrong path, but that doesn't mean you need to be on the wrong path. That's what we're trying to tell you here, brother, is look, you have you have a chance right now. And like the Sheikh was saying, brother, you, you can't even guarantee that your heart is going to beat the next 30 seconds, let alone that you're going to wake up tomorrow. So if you if you're yeah, in agreement yeah. with what we're saying when it comes to God, you're halfway there. What like what other questions would you have for us so we can get you there? Forget about your forefathers; they're gone, right? M mine are too. You need to worry about yourself, and you need to worry about your future generations. Mm -hmm. yeah. What what do you know about Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? No, yeah, it, it, see, there are a lot of controversial things going on. Not see, I, I do know that there are some opposite opposition uh, yes. uh, people. Look, look we are friends. here to so answer. How do, I, how, do I learn the, how do I learn the right history about him? Because if I become a Muslim and if, and if I defend a person, yes, I you know uh, how, how do I know about him? Because I I strongly believe that. I should not defend a wrong person, being yeah, a rational you, guy. You're absolutely if I support, right. I should know about him. How do I know it? Okay. Well, look, as I said, did you hear what I said before? I said people has written books and books and books in their millions of pages of books about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if we continue to write until the day of the judgment, trust me, it would not finish. So, so, you want to know everything about the prophet you will not be able to no, 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 not, not, not everything definitely not about the uh, just about the few controversial things which surround around okay yeah, maybe well, give, give me give me give me a question about your toughest one the one that really no, no. really is making is making a big contention to you no. Okay. Today, that, that's the reason why I corrected to want this clarification. Today, my talk yeah. is only surrounding about is uh, is marriage, because that is one of the controversial thing which is happened in India. If, if yes. someone want to criticize, it, that's the topic they take. So yeah. I want a clarification. That, look, look, uh, look. Which, for example, who who is the best? To the, to defend the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Look, the people the people that were with him and they were the, the, his staunch enemy, his worst enemies. When he married Aisha radiallahu anha, they never saw that as an insult or something like that. But what you have to understand, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a leader was not just a prophet he was a leader he was a warrior he was all the things that you'd expect like someone in in resp with responsibilities to to be now you know like in even here in europe even in in, in india in your in your tradition 
people in order to 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 have pacts together what's the best way to do it is through marriage for example the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the father of aisha was his best kind of friend kind of like he was always with him he spent on him all his money he was he was his right hand and everything so what was best for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to do to consolidate that kind of friendship and that but to marry the daughter of abu bakr radiallahu an which is aisha then what you have you have subhanallah you have uh, Aisha, Umm al Mu'minin, she herself, she's better knowing of herself than anyone. She said, When I became a woman, the Prophet وسلم, married me, meaning had, had uh, consumed the, the marriage. She said about herself, When I became a woman. Now, in Islam, we have got girl, which is a girl, then we have got women. There is nothing in between. You either a girl or you are a woman. Now, when someone reaches puberty and they have their menses, then they 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 go into the womenhood. They are not in childhood anymore. They go to the uh, womenhood, if there is such a word like womenhood anyway. So th they become women. Now, what's the other thing? The second thing, like what Brother Man, uh, Hashim was telling you, is to have the ability, the, the mental ability. Did Aisha have that mental ability? Yes, she did have it. Did she have the physical ability? Yes, she had it. What you have to understand that at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what do you think the average uh, age was for, for for living living age? People, because of the fights, because of the, the 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 wars that used to happen, people some people would never see see their uh, their, their youth. They, they never reach twenty. They were never to reach twenty five. So it was really. Why do you think there is a lots of widow? There was a lots of widowed and all of this. It's because people used to die at an early age. The reason because of the wars that used to happen. So it was only. It was only the case that people used to marry at a young age so that they can ha they can reproduce and have children and then so that life goes goes on as normal otherwise we would have been extinct the arab race would have been extinct had they had they started waiting until someone is 30 or 35 to get married and uh, there is a book by an orientalist called Nabiya Abbott. She speaks in it about the marriage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Aisha. And she says that was the best thing that he has ever done because of the knowledge of Aisha radiallahu anha, because of her status, because of the status of her father and so on. So basically, and this Nabiya Abbott, she is no lover of the prophet she is, she doesn't love the prophet she is an orientalist she she is not a muslim and she has died she passed away but there is a book she has written regarding regarding the wives of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and she said that that was a clever move and it was a good thing that cemented a good relationship between between uh, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and the Prophet. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a man who died, who died and his shield was pawned with a Jew for some food that he got for his family. So he was a humble man, a person who everybody loved and everybody called the truthful one. The He was, he was a man that subhanallah no man is like him so but i have one concern but the, the, what i i do understand the ancient time the practices and cultural norms are completely different and uh, that we should never judge with the current cultural norms about yes. what happened in the ancient time. i don't understand that 100 so what's your agree. concern brother what's your concern my, my, yeah my concern is what if now i think 
uh, if I'm not wrong, there are certain Muslims in certain Middle East. I saw some documentaries that they are taking this particular marriage uh, between Prophet Muhammad and Aisha, and they they are mm -hmm. also doing the same thing, taking that as an inspiration mm -hmm. to justify child marriage. Certain Muslim men who are 50 plus age marrying a very young child because right now in our cultural norm it is not allowed i yeah. I, I couldn't even if i become a muslim i yeah. would never agree a 50 yes. year old man if he, if he wants to marry my nine year old child yeah. i would probably kill him if he comes but, and asks me that i want to marry prasad, prasad but, but look there is a very important thing you said you say child marriage when aisha married the prophet وسلم, she wasn't a child Meaning, when she no, no, I mean, no, I'm was now, I mean, this, she was uh, betrothed to him. She was betrothed to him, and then, and then, uh, married like uh, the, the marriage was was. So she was betrothed at six, married at, uh, at nine. That was that was the norm then. <laughs> nowadays, nowadays, I can put my hands in the fire that there is no one anywhere in the world that. Muslims, I'm talking about Muslims that will marry mm -hmm. his nine years old daughter to someone who's there isn't. Why? Because it doesn't happen. Even by today's, by today's nine years old are are not like them days. A nine year old no, nowadays does not even know how to fry an egg, let alone let alone run a house. It's not, it's not even yeah, that. I, 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 the, the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also told us to follow the rules and the laws of the land. So if I'm in New York, uh, yeah. right, if I'm in New York and the legal age of consent here is 18, well, I can't just, you know, do whatever I want. No, I have to follow the rules and the laws of this land, right? That's that's the land that I live in. So So do you have people who do things that... Where they consider themselves Muslims? Yes. Would we consider them under the term Muslims? Probably not. Also, nowhere does the Prophet Sallallahu say, marry a woman at this age. No. The brother Hashim clearly gave you criteria that has to be fulfilled before you do anything. So so, so the, the documentaries you are watching, it's, it's instances where it's one in a a million and just to add know. on this point um brother central Dawa, you see look yeah we really need to differentiate between the teaching of islam and cultural practices right exactly there That's are what many many countries around the world they take their cultural practices and they think this is the practice that is endorsed by islam okay so you might find certain objectionable practices because that's been their tradition that's their culture and so on so that's why we really need to differentiate and see which is which of those practices are Islam accepts and endorses them or not, and which ones not. So if we can't differentiate and we think people's practices is what it is, Islam, then we would not know what the true teaching of Islam is. In fact, Islam came to mold people from within their culture and their cultural practices and told them specifically what of their cultural practices are acceptable, what not. You know, the Arabs before Islam, they were quite happy in terms of, when I say happy, um, in burying their own daughters alive. That's their cultural practice. Everyone was doing it. You know, everyone was doing it. The moment mm -hmm. a girl was born, you will see their faces going black and so on because of financial liability. Um, so it was their practice to bury them alive. And the Quran came to say, like, you know, for what reason was she buried when she was we were asked? Like, you know, for what reason she was killed? So these practices became uprooted, of course. So likewise, there were various other practices Islam eliminated from the societies. And likewise, in any society that Muslims live in, their cultural practices will be you know, judged according to the Islamic standards of acceptability. Is it acceptable? It's not acceptable. For example, is a very interesting example. In in the West or in Europe, uh, especially the cultures of uh, Christians and others who are, who are the majority of culturally people in terms of in this eating habit, which hand do they use to eat? Like if they have a, a knife or a fork, do they eat with their right hand or the left hand? 
leave it to the left hand, right? In in our countries, in the Indian subcontinent, we all everyone uses the right hand, right? You know, Prasad, I'm sure you use the right hand to eat. Yes, yes, right hand. Yeah, yeah. But if we go to Europe and you know America and other places, they use their left hand to eat. So this is a cultural practice. So what will happen, as is, what has happened is when Muslims came to these countries, they didn't just change to the cultural norm of using the fork on their left hand and eat. They would not adopt this practice because that goes against the sunnah, the, the practice of the Prophet ﷺ, his teachings. So if a non-Muslim, you know, a white person, for example, um, a European or American, if they became a Muslim, they would have to change their practice of eating with their left hand and they'll start eating with the right hand because that's the sunnah, the tradition, the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ. Sometimes it's very difficult. Some people have find very difficulty continuously, but this is the struggle that they have to make and take because this is how it shows you your commitment to the submission that you're making towards your Lord. It's a commitment that one needs to really continuously show. So coming back to this point, about something you said is quite interesting though. I think you need to really think um, again in terms of your approach. Today I'm talking about a lot of approaches in people's perspectives. If a man 60 years old, married a nine year old, you'd feel like K-I-L-L them, right? That's what you said, right? I find that this is this approach, you know, you didn't, you don't mean that, but that kind of approach should not be the case yeah. because Sometimes, I know you didn't mean that, sometimes we might not like something, but it's better for us. And we might like something which is not better for us. Quran says so. Hmm? Um, uh, Sheikh Hazan, if you remember the ayah. Yeah. There might be something that is, uh, you know, better for you, but you dislike it. And something that, you know, you dislike is good for you and so on. So, we need to know in terms of our likenesses, our comfort zone is not what determines what is acceptable to God or not. We need to change our likenesses to what God wants from us. Okay. So when it comes to this um, marriage that you think is quite an obstacle, as, as our esteemed brothers have explained, that Islam did not provide a particular age. And for obvious reasons, as you've understood, because cultures, times, situations, environment, you know, which part of the world you are on the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere or in the equatorial region. Um, it depends based on this when you do mat mature yourself into a woman. So a woman, when they become a woman, transitioning from childhood to adulthood, it varies from time to time, place to place. Islam didn't, that's why fix a particular age it laid a condition that she needs to be mature, as the Sheikh uh, Ibn Hazm said. She needs to be okay, uh, no harm should be done, so physical and intellectual maturity. Sometimes it might come earlier to some people, sometimes it might come later. And that's why if it comes shocking to you, and it should do, even if a 25-year-old is not physically mature and mentally mature, she shouldn't get into physical intimacy of marriage, right? Absolutely. So there's no such thing as 18 years old as a license or a 21 years old. Islam doesn't give this kind of you know arbitrary age. It it may be a general age based on people's uh, culture and times, but Islam is more flexible and universal in its approach, in which it transcends time and place. So even someone in Africa or someone in you know in in Washington, they can still get married based on the universal principle of marriage. So. If you look at most of the marriages of the Prophet, as highlighted by Ibn Hazm, they were done for social reasons, social political reasons, to bring the communities together by marrying, is it Safiya? Safiya the, Allah, Allah, Allah. the whole, the Jewish tribe, the community, they became friends rather than being an, an, an enemy to the Muslim community at that time. So likewise, there were many... Uh, Mary al Qibtiya. Exactly, Mary the Coptic. Uh, she was a uh, from that Christian community, if, if I'm not mistaken, right? From that her community, yeah, Coptic. Yeah, Coptic. So you can see how during the expansion of Islam, when, as Prophet Wasallam wanted to bring people together to Islam, he did this in various ways through the instructions of God, how bringing people and communities together. So this was not showing one man and his lust and his desires, because that was the case. Prashad, think. Why would someone marry someone in the first instance? A wife 
who is older than him and he was married to her for all of his time period when she was alive and didn't marry anyone else and after she passed away then of course he did other marriages and most of his marriages are women who are widowed and with children and orphans so if someone was after lust and desires, he'd be looking for young girls all the time. In fact, Aisha anha, was the only exception, uh, the young uh, bride of Rasulullah So this kind of you know thinking about the Prophet's character in terms of his you know etiquette in relationship with other women, you need to take whole thing in context. How did he behave with women? How did he deal with women? How did Aisha radiallahu anha explain her position after Prophet ﷺ passed away. She should have said, oh, now I'm so relieved this particular individual, you know, he was abusing me and harassing me and, and so on and so forth. But in fact, in fact, a lot of Islam has come from her, from her teachings, traditions that we learned from mm -hmm. her, the characteristic that she portrayed about this noble Prophet ﷺ in her own words, how much the Prophet loved him and how much he showed the care and support and none of the negativity that we hear that we And expect. he died, sorry, sorry, Brother Masur, he died with his head on her chest. On her chest. So, so we would expected negativity and reactions of negative kind from her if she was an, in an abusive relationship with the Prophet because there was an age gap. But instead, that we don't see anything like that. I know because of today's mental conditioning of when men should get married or males should get married to a female or males should get married to a male and females should get married to a female and so on. All this mental conditioning has made people said, okay, it should be equivalent and so on and so forth. But look at the hypocrisy and double standard sometimes. If someone is very, very rich, mega rich, right? A billionaire, a 90-year-old, a 70-year-old, and she, he marries someone, 19 year old. No one questions it anymore. 20 year old, no one questions. Even though from 20 to 75, look at the age gap. It, people don't care because now someone very famous and wealthy and rich is marrying. In fact, women want to marry these people. I mean, for economic, financial reasons and benefit. And the society, the Western society, others, doesn't seem to be bothered about it. So we really need to ask our conscience, I mean, where is the objection and excuse? Is it because she was a child? And the answer is from our traditions, she did not get her uh, marriage consummated until she became a woman. Okay, so that removes that option. If it's to do with, you know, the age gap, then why is that a problem? Because you have two adults who have no problems between themselves, love, the, the support, the companionship. We have this arbitrary thing that, you know, it has to be like for like, you know, I have to have someone companionship, you know, similar to my age and so on. No, no, this is the mentality that we have adopted today. Okay. That's the Western sort of liberal mindset and so on. But again, that is not consistently followed. So what are the objections then when it comes to the marriage of Rasulullah If one goes deeply into every single marriage, and I think you should do the do that you know, likewise, uh, a critical analysis of the marriage of the Prophet Islam, one marriage case by case. What was the marriage reason? How was it consummated? You know, how was the the wife of the Prophet Islam? Do we have any reports from her in terms of being abused and so on? So look at each one. And was it a political, you know, reasons the marriage got conducted? Was it a humanitarian reason? Because he did this because, you know, there was no one to look after this particular lady and 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 orphan children. If you go and examine each marriage case by case, and in fact you won't be able to, um, you won't. Uh, what I meant to say is, it's not going to be difficult for you to find that because many Muslim uh, friends of ours have actually written about it in their blogs and in websites. Okay, and you will find the marriage, the list of all that, all the people within that, when and where, what political situation the marriage was conducted, and so on. Look at it in a critical mindset, you know, outside the shoes of, you know, conditioning and some kind of, you know, you know, bias against the Prophet Islam for no reason, emotional bias. Then make that decision. Is it really an obstacle or not? And in fact, the young marriage of Aisha radiallahu anha, I want to ask you to go and search about this. 
Before 200 or 300 years ago, did any one of the critics of Islam brought this as an example objection? No if one. no one brought this for 1,200 mm. years or so, right? No one even objected this. So that means it's a new kind of objections because people, their mentality have changed. It started in 1906. With the, it started in 1906, the beginning of the, uh, or the turn of the 20th century when it started. So from yeah. some polemicists and uh, orientalists, yeah. that's when it so, started. So to, to, to this point, I want to add something. In terms of objections to Islam, it's never going to come to an end because there will be always people who would not accept Islam or want to follow Islam, and they will try to bring some objections. In. And I won't be surprised Later on, if people brought this objection, like, oh, the Quran says you can kill animals and eat them, and we should be all vegetarians. Well, this has already happened. People are objecting to Qurbani, right? Saying, why do you have to do the Qurbani? Why can't you just do an alternative money to the poor and so on and so forth? People will come with so many different things because if they don't like something, it becomes their ob obstacles. You see, Islam says it's not about your liking and not liking, you need to refine your liking or your dislikes and likes and come to live with a standard of God who says this is, these are the do's and don'ts, these are the paradigms, these are the boundaries. So when Islam endorses <coughs> defensive fighting against an enemy, let's not talk about the offensive yet, I want to highlight a point. There are some people who will say, why do you have to even fight? When the enemy comes, let them do whatever they have to do. But you know that how this is the weak mentality of people. That this is the defeatist mentality in which you know people have no courage left, no honor left, no dignity left. They're saying when the enemy comes and wants to rape you and so on and so, you know, tell oh I've got my you know the little one over there hiding. Oh, you shouldn't be doing that. You should stand up as a human being, as a man, as a as a brother, as a father, as a husband, and defend your family and your honor and so on. And if you do that. Defending, you know, in, in the light of your front of enemy, you become a martyr. You'll become a shaheed. Not that you live a life of cowardice and and so on and so forth. Because there's something, you know, every human being knows there's some honor and dignity that we have, and that's why Prashad, people do not want to prostrate to God, the atheist. Do you know why? Because they think they're so themselves. And why should I humble myself, put my head on the ground to some, you know, creator, or whatever? Because that, that feelings of pride and arrogance, everyone has it. Islam wants to channel that pride and arrogance in the right way and says, look, you need to have this for the right purposes. So when it comes to your own self, your own dignity, on your honor of your family and so on, you know, make sure you behave like that. Don't be like a the youth, right? So like, like, you know, you let your women, you know, in, in such a way that you don't even care, like your wife. Imagine how you see in modern society today. Man, or a male walks with a female, his girlfriend, right? And his girlfriend is dressed up very provocative way. He thinks like, oh, it's fine. People will be happy that I've got a beautiful, you know, attractive girlfriend. But what he doesn't realize is she's being, you know, sort of, you know, lusted upon by other people and so on. So in his absence, if friends were to come or, you know, some people were to come, they will try to find ways and means to get into her. Right to to lie with her and so on and so forth. That's what will happen because of what? Not his ghira, his protective jealous jealousy. In Islam, we have this ghira as Muslims. We have this protective jealousy that we protect our woman. We don't want her to be pried upon and so on and so forth. Because just like I have my honor, and so has uh, the honor that of of my wife and 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 my you know woman folk and so on and so forth. So Islam wants to model and mold the human character and behavior for of course to enable enable themselves okay you can't get this with current liberal mindset in which it's okay in the near future people will say it's okay to sleep with a dog as long as you know you know you don't harm the dog you won't be surprised people will come up with this kind of you know uh, acceptability and so on but islam has a framework of how human behavior should be that's how it makes islam not ever compromising to any time and places. You have seen in the Western civilization how the church and the state have been separated, right? Politics have been totally divorced from the church and now they are ruled by 
uh, mm. different kind of systems and not no longer by Christianity or Catholicism or Papism, for example. And because of that, they've come away from the religion, the following. They they it's okay to have all of the things they're doing, right? So Islam would not give to this demand, but rather it will protect itself with these universal laws and guidance God has given. So people will have objections, and I wouldn't be surprised if people didn't have that. But the reality is we need to be critical-minded and look into those objections and see which ones are really justifiable objections or which is not. And that's why we say, you know, you won't find anything that is really intellectually objection to Islam. All the objections that is there is mainly from emotions and some kind of, you know, not knowing what Islam is. So the fear of the unknown or some kind of hatred and bigotry, as people will see, because, you know, the jealousy aspect is there. You know, why are you like this? And they, they can't love to see that Islam is growing and Islam is flourishing and so on and so forth. But our approach is different. And that's why in the Islamic civilization, when in the courts of Khalif, uh, say, you know, the, you know, what's his name? You know, they have Bait al-Hikmah and others. Um, yeah. some of the, uh, al in, no, no, the Khalif, the Khulafa at that time, when they have Bait al-Hikmah oh. established, um, like al-Ma'moon and various others. Like, yeah, yeah, the Abbasi, the Abbasi, the Abbasi. You, you will see that Muslims, non-Muslims, whether they were Christians or Jews, they were within this house of knowledge investigating about the world, looking at the stars, naming them, looking, working out the working of the universe and so on and so forth, together. Islam made it possible, together. It wasn't just Islamic civilization as a Muslim civilization. Islamic civilization included non-Muslims, Christians and Jews, all contributing towards it. How was yeah, that? Look what happened in, uh, in Andalus, for example. Yeah. How did that happen and how is it possible? Because Islam made sure an environment was possible like that. So that human knowledge, human, um, you know, in terms of their achievement can really go to, to the peak and to the heights as they did. And that's why they're called the, the golden peak of Islamic civilization in which when the Europe was in dark ages, Islam wasn't. Andalus, Spain. They were the, the, the height of civilization with science, technology, agriculture, and so on and so forth. People don't know this because they don't study it. Yeah. So, Prashad, I don't think if you study critically and deeply uh, and reflect on this, that this marriage is going to be an obstacle. It's there as an emotional obstacle. But I think, you know, look into each examples, and I, I'm sure and I am hopeful that that will not be the case. So, having said this, is there any anything else that is obstacle or new to say Islam looks truthful to I mean, truth in them? So, Islam looks like this is the religion ideology to believe in, but I still have um, some problems or concerns or objection to any of these other things. This is the time to get explained uh, from Sheikh Ibn Hazm and our brothers Central Dawa, Maurice and Hashim. You know, that's a good opportunity for you to do that. Sure, sure. Thank you so much for your explanation. Uh, also, please do uh, clarify me on the the, the, the relationship between uh, Prophet Muhammad and uh, uh, Safiya uh, after the Battle of Khyber War. I also read some article about that thing. So how does that event actually happen? Some some article, obviously it's a non-Muslim article. It says that uh, he married uh, Safiya after the war where he killed uh, uh, her husband or father and then he married. Her father died two, beforehand. Was it a fabricated, fabricated one? Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. So um, what, what I would suggest is before you hear the answers from uh, the esteemed panelists, if you go into... ICRAA.ikra. Okay. Um, there's an article on there by Brother Waqar Chima explaining that in detail exactly where what the facts of the reality is. And you will see the objection becomes uh, unjustified uh, uh, in, in every single way that whatever people bring. Okay. I, if you can bring this up, Hashim, if you can. ICRRA, marriage about Safiya. I know. Uh, it's either on this new website or let me turn the tables, the older website. The article is there. I've just re read it recently as well. So you can see in, in a, with all the references exactly what point, what was her attitude and when did the marriage get consummated 
was it um, by will or not? Was there a waiting period or not? All of that is explained, okay? So if you ever come through these objections, it's likely that there are some responses by Muslims already, okay? Because internet is there at everyone's fingertips. We should look for, you know, a criticism and a counter criticism or a reply by the believers. So if I'm going to look for, I mean, this, this is, I mean, let me tell you the, the, you know, the modus operandi, for example, of me. If I want to bring an accusation to a Christian doctrine or practice, first, I will look at what the accusation is and I will try to go as much uh, possible in terms of the academic works or even in the website and so on, the Christian responses. Okay, if you see my, you know, top of my shelf, there's lots of books by Christian uh, uh, academics or evangelists or polemicists in terms of how they reply to common objections and accusations. How do they reply? Because if you find that there's a good enough uh, response, then why do you go and start accusing there's an objection or, or going about an objection because the objection is not justifiable? Yeah. So likewise, your approach and everyone's approach should be the similar like this. If you hear something about Islam, there's an objection to Islam on its, uh, you know, creed, on its belief, on its theology, on its practice. Look at the response. The response could be a YouTube video, it could be a podcast, it could be an article on the website. But I, I'm positive most of these are already available, and in fact, we are working to see if there's something that's not responded to. And this is one of the things that we do um, in, in Dawa-wise and working together with other networked uh, Muslim uh, du'at or Muslim uh, brothers who are working uh, in, in this, you know, uh, uh, establishing Islam as a true and, and responding to uh, doubts and objections. We also look for like, if there's anything left that is not answered, you know? In fact, if people, our brothers or sisters or our friends who are, you know, in the comment section, if you have found something that there's no re response from the Muslims, let us know, and we will work on a response. And we've been doing this for the last, uh, you know, decades. Um, so it's always, you know, in, in our estimation, all the responses that's required is there. But if we don't find it adequate, we can have a discussion. So, um, Sheikh Ibn Hazm, you wanted to reply to the questions uh, about uh, yeah. and then Central Dawah thing had it to say something as well. So we'll hear let, let Brother uh, Central Dawah go. Go, go. go, Brother Central Dawah, go. I, I would simply just say that um, according to uh, Tabakat al Kubra, volume 8, I think page 97, it says when Safiya came to the Prophet, وسلم, she said, he said to her, among the Jews, your father did not stop in his enmity towards me until Allah destroyed him. She said, O oh Allah's messenger, indeed, Allah says in his book, no one will take anyone else's burden. So the prophet said to her, make your choice. If you choose Islam, I select you for myself. And if you choose Judaism, I will set you free and send you to your people. She said, O oh Allah's messenger, indeed, I longed for Islam and I testified for you even before you gave me this invitation when I came to you. I have no guardian among the Jews, neither father nor brother, and I prefer, prefer Islam over disbelief. Allah and his messenger are dearer to me than the freedom to return to my people. So you can clearly see that Safiya, she wanted to marry the Prophet and it was completely her choice. And, and to add to that, to add to that, Safiya actually she knew about his prophethood long before before even the, because her father, because she's from the lineage of Harun alayhi salam, she's from the lineage of Harun, and uh, the people of that that the uh, that they are from the lineage of Harun, they are the scribes, and what happened? What happened? What happened then? That. When the Prophet وسلم, came to Medina, her father and her uncle, they went to see if he is the, the true Prophet that was awaited in Arabia or not. When they saw him, they came back and he, her father said to her uncle, is it him? He said, yes, it is him. He said, so what shall we do? Believe in him? He said, I will never stop being his enemy until I die. Now, to that, the killing of her family and that, and the, not, also, not only there, even because she was married, her husband, but she had a dream where she was telling her mother 
that in the dream she saw the moon and the moon come and landed in her in her uh, uh, lap and uh, the moon landed in her lap so her mother her mother slapped her meaning the moon the moon was the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and and uh, landing in her lap that means the the marriage and as our esteemed brothers uh, central da'wah has told you she was given a choice and and guess what by the way before even being given to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when the the spoil of war were divided she was she was with one of the sahaba of the companions of the prophet but because of her status and her beauty and everything regarding her the sahabi the companion of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, 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 used alter, altruism and he gave her to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said oh prophet of allah you are more suited for her than i than i am and she th this is how she landed with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and i believe our our ustad hashim was showing you an article to read about the marriage of safiya to uh, to uh, to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but then i would like to ask you a question if someone if you were a head of state and you were in a war against some enemies that came to annihilate you to destroy you and you had an, a pact with some with some another country and that country betrays you they want to they want to stab you from the back once you are victorious in your first war what would you do uh, brother prasad um if i'm the head of state if some country backstab my pact and if that causes uh, some life loss from my side as a military person i would uh, execute whoever was responsible for that the, the, the military thank leaders you. not the people thank you well, this is what happened the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 10000 10000 of the polytheists came to destroy al madina so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Uh, did what we call it uh, a trench dug a trench so and they were fighting so the jews went went to stop the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from his back and then once the the the, uh, the trench battle finished he turned to them <coughs> why because of treason now anybody even in india your your your, your punishment for treason is capital punishment most countries for 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 treason it's capital punishment so these people wanted to destroy islam so it was only fair that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam once he finished the battle of the trench he went to them but look you know we answered so many of your question of your questions by allah don't let don't let these nuances stop you from the from the pleasures of the hereafter i just want the good for you and so does hashim so does brother muris so does brother central dawa so does mansour we all want the best for you so are yeah. you ready are you ready to say it behind me uh the shahada yes we invite you to islam all it takes اشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمد رسول الله are you ready brother I don't believe be the first one be the, why be the first really one cool. to to establish monotheism in your family don't be like the forefathers that you followed like the verse we read in the quran be the man that your children children that your children's children look back and say My great grandfather brought me where I am today. Be that man, and that generational culture and all that stuff that you used to follow, brother. This is your chance right here. And look, you you have a panel full of brothers that are going to be here to answer these questions. There's not a single question mm -hmm. you presented that we haven't answered. And and from what I can tell, you're sufficient with those answers. And this is what we offer, bro. We don't we don't just tell you come to Islam and then we just you know leave you hanging. No bro we're we're here for you I'm here for you every single brother here is going to be here for you man
That's what we're inviting you to. Allah, brother Prasad, Bismillah. Are you ready? Sure, please go ahead. Yalla. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Welcome, brother. Allahi, brother Prasad. This is the best thing you have done in your life until today. You are 32. You just been born today. You are just been born today, brother. Yeah, uh, Brother Prasad, I wanted to tell you, man, I'm really proud of you because you're not succumbing to the social pressures and you're staying genuine uh, in your quest for uh, acquisition of knowledge. And I promise you, man, um, you know, I've been in your shoes before. Uh, Islam is the only religion, the only creed, the only way of life, the only deen that actually has the answers that you're looking for. So when you present these questions, if you... Uh, present your attention with an open heart and an open mind, and you actually genuinely go for seeking of this knowledge, you'll get the answer. And the answers are more than satisfactory. You'll never ever in this religion be um, uh, hung on like a, I have no idea, you know, uh, we don't know what that is, but it's, it's like kind of somewhat similar like this. So I'm glad that you're not bending to those uh, social pressures and you should really be proud of yourself, man. You, like it's a it's a, a nice honor for us to witness your shahada and welcome you into the family. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Have you uh, are there mosques near you? Mm, yes. Yeah. So inshallah, inshallah, visit a mosque. Go to the Imam, tell him I'm a new Muslim and that, and they will help you on a daily basis. We in here, we are here every Thursday. So every Thursday you are more than welcome. Like other people that embraced Islam with us, they continue to come and see us on the, and that. Take, take inshallah the, down the email address and email, drop us an email, anything, any concern that you have got or any kind of like question that you want clarifying, please do not hesitate. Please do not. Yeah, you are our brother and you are an addition to 2 billion, 2 billion believers worldwide. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Sure, sure. Thank you. And I posted a link uh, yeah. in the back chat for you, by the way, bro. I, 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 yeah. Because right now, uh, it's like I'm I'm at one of the lowest point in my life. Um, that uh, I think this is the time period where I started to explore more. Because the more uh, lowest point in my life, I started to move away from my religion. Because I tried to question a lot of my religion, and I didn't find spirituality in place. And a lot of time, I heard uh, I, I I used to hear Adhan in the in the headset, you know. Sometimes yeah. in the middle of the night, I just listen to it and I cry for no reason because I was sometimes alone. Alhamdulillah. I think why we have You know, that's your natural inclination. Your natural inclination asking you to, to make that choice, to answer that call. That's a call that was like for you to answer it. And do you, guess what you've done? Alhamdulillah, today you have done it. And you have given us the honor. You have given us the honor of witnessing your shahada. May Allah reward you in this life and the hereafter by the high, one of the highest ranks of paradise, brother. Do you remember early on we were discussing about uh, listening to the Quran so that uh, you will feel the calmness, the tranquility? Yes. yes. You know, now, when you listen to the Quran, not only you'll get the reward because you're a Muslim, but you know the uh, tranquility is a bonus then. So you'll be doing... Allah be the Kirillahi. Brother, brother Hashim, what does yes. Allah Jalla wa Allah says in Quran? Allah be the Kirillahi tatma in the Qulub. Verily, with the remembrance of Allah, the hearts find tranquility. Yes. Finds tranquility, Alhamdulillah. Mm.
Yeah. One, so one other. Everything you do is not just research now. You're getting reward for every step you take in the direction of learning about Islam, about researching about Islam. You know, even if you approach your friend for help or email someone, you know, like dawahis at gmail.com, all of that steps you take is going to be recorded in your hasanat, in your in, in the mizan, in your, in your, as a reward for you, inshallah. Yeah, like uh, like we said, you know, reach out to us if you need anything. You know, our email is there. Um, you know, Brother Maurice, mashallah, Brother Central Dawa, they all have the channels. You can reach out to them. You know, we so yeah, don't don't consider yourself as a stranger. And uh, there's actually a website. Maybe you want to take a note of this. Take a screenshot. Uh, it's called newmuslimacademy.org. Oh, no. You can get a lot of help. Sorry. Sure. Yeah. So inshallah, yeah, Brother Prasad. So uh, do you have any anything you want to say before we bring in another guest? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you so much for your time and explanation. I'm sure that uh, there's more, more, uh, uh, you know, more thing to learn about religion. And uh, maybe I have yeah. a bigger, you know, bigger, you bigger fight in future. Bigger yeah, you fight said there was a... Um, it was a low point in your life, you know. Look, life is like this. Everybody has ups and downs, and as Allah says in the Quran, you know, after hardship comes ease. So don't think that uh, this is going to carry on. And especially now that you have entered Islam, Allah will put blessings and barakah in your life from places you never imagined. So yeah, don't lose heart. Whenever you have any difficulties, put your head on the floor and pray to the Almighty. You know, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Speak to him directly. We don't have any middlemen. We don't need to go to any statues or anything like that. You know, you can connect directly to Allah because uh, when you are doing your salah, your prayers, you know, when you are prostrating with your head on the floor, that is like the lowest a human can get. And you're submitting to no one other than the one who created you, me, and the entire universe, you know, who sustains us, gives us uh, everything that we need. Uh, because he knows what we need. So you might pray for something that you think you need, but he might give you something better maybe, or something else, which you're more deserving of. So inshallah, don't lose heart, don't lose your hope. Keep between hope and fear. This is what Iman is actually. So do not be completely complacent that now you're a Muslim, like you're permitted to, uh, I don't know, you'll go straight away to Jannah. If Allah wills, you will. But we should always, you know, go about our daily life between hope and fear, which means that you are always God conscious. Whatever you're doing, everything you do, every action you take, you have to be conscious about the fact that somebody is watching you and he's none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, so inshallah, you know, take take it easy one step at a time. Make friends at your local mosque, like the Sheikh said, which is very important for you to remain connected with the Muslim community. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I just, you know, <laughs> went to a different <laughs> room for a while and then I came saying, saying, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah. That's, Alhamdulillah. that's really, really, really good. MashaAllah. You know, this is, Allah shows to us that people who are sincere are the ones who are the ones who are ready to accept Islam and yeah. Allah. He right. came last time as well, and he was pretty open about everything. So he was yeah. answering honestly, you know. Uh, you know, Allah gives it. Uh, yeah, Allah bless all your brothers uh, immensely. Uh, for this, Jazakallah. Yeah. Mashallah. Alhamdulillah. I mean.